Oh, if you are if you're happy, Senator Cullen, we can go to question time 30 seconds early. We'll... Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister rep <coughs> representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Today's release of labour force figures for May show a further 227,700 jobs were lost, bringing the total jobs lost since March to 835,000. How many of these losses could have been prevented if the government had extended JobKeeper? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, I mean, indeed, uh, today employment uh, today was announced. Employment fell uh, by almost 227,000 jobs in <clears throat> May 2020, uh, including uh, 89,100 full-time jobs and 138,600 uh, part-time jobs. Uh, I mean, it's 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 another sad day, um, but we of course knew that this was coming. Um, I mean, in, in case the opposition missed it, we are dealing with a one in a hundred years global pandemic, and with the very significant uh, health and economic consequences of that pandemic uh, here in Australia and around the world. And if you compare Australia's performance, uh, both in terms of the health response as well as in terms of the economic impact and the jobs impact, uh, we are performing comparatively well. Uh, which, which, is not, uh, which, is not, which, which obviously doesn't take away the fact that this is a very difficult time for lots of Australians. And we've always been upfront about the fact that as we work our way through this crisis, as we work our way through this crisis, uh, you know, many Australians... Order, sadly, Senator Gallagher, on a point of order. Point of order, just on relevance, the question um, was uh, how many of the job losses could have been prevented if the, if the government had extended JobKeeper. Um, we've only got 54 seconds left for the question. Uh, and that was the conclusion of the question. I, I, I would consider the minister to be directly relevant if he is talking about the labour force figures that you commenced the question with. Uh, I'm listening carefully to his answer. Senator Corbyn. Uh, th thank you very much, Mr uh, President. This is a pretty serious moment for our nation, and, and, I, think, and I think I should be allowed to provide the uh, explanation and position of the government. Uh, this, is, this, is a, this is a very difficult time for many Australians, in particular those who, through no fault of their own, have lost their job. Uh, as what the government has set out to do, working with governments around Australia, is to get on top of the health threat uh, by slowing down the uh, spread of the virus and suppress the spread of the virus by providing uh, support to businesses uh, to ensure that uh, as many Australians as possible could remain connected uh, to those businesses. And we've also, of course, provided significantly enhanced transitional support uh, to those Australians who, who lost their job. Uh, effectively, I mean, the, the <clears throat> anyone who doesn't uh, get support through JobKeeper is, of course, able to access uh, co uh, consistent Order. with appropriate arrangements. Is able to access jobs. Order, Senator payments. Cormann. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. A total of 2.3 million workers were affected by either losing their job or working re reduced hours in May, reflecting a fifth of the entire workforce. How many more Australians will lose their jobs in September when Mr Morrison snaps back JobKeeper? Senator Cormann. Uh, th th thank you very much, Mr President. Um, what, what I would say in response to the last part of the question is we will continue to make responsible decisions, as we have done so far, uh, to ensure that uh, we have the strongest possible economic recovery and that uh, Australians have the best possible opportunity to get back into work and to get ahead. Uh, you know, th these are not easy considerations. These are not easy decisions. I mean, you might want to pretend that there are some uh, magic bullets that can somehow make it all go away. We are, we are, we are doing the absolute best we can, and we're, we're doing absolutely the best we can to ensure we have the strongest possible economic recovery on the other side, and that jobs and that people get back into jobs as quickly as possible. And of course, it is already happening. It is already happening as the economy, as uh, restrictions on the economy are being eased. People are able to get back uh, into some of those jobs that had been lost. Uh, it, would, it would, of course, more people would be able to get back into work if uh, some of those states would open those uh, state borders. I mean, if, if they, if order, the order, Senator Cormann. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Minister, the underutilisation rate now stands at 20.2 per cent, which is a new record high. In the face of the first recession in 29 years and the highest unemployment figures in 20 years, why is Mr Morrison so determined to snap back and leave people behind? 
Senator Cormann. Uh, uh, thank, you, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, President. I completely reject the uh, premise of that last part of the question. We are very focused on making sure that no one is left behind. We are very focused on making sure that no one is left behind. But this is, this, I mean, in case, in case the opposition didn't notice, we are going through a pretty difficult period as a result of something that, didn't, that we didn't cause that workforce participation levels before the COVID-19 pandemic hit were the highest on records. In particular, female, female participation uh, right, was the highest ever. And, and of course, I mean, we've been hit by a pretty devastating uh, virus uh, that has had a pretty devastating effect on our economy and on economies around the world. But you know what, in Australia, the Australian people know that compared to other countries around the world, we are actually doing comparatively well. That doesn't mean that people aren't feeling hardship and difficulties. Of course they are. And we are focused on making sure that we get back uh, to, uh, into the strongest possible position as soon as possible. Senator Molan. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. In light of the unprecedented economic situation caused by COVID-19 pandemic, can the minister update the Senate on the Australian Labor figures for the month of May and what steps the Morrison government is taking to drive our economic recovery from the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Molan for his question. And as the leader of the Senate has stated, uh, Australia and Australians have shown great resilience in the face of COVID-19, which has caused both a worldwide health and economic crisis. Uh, Mr. President, the labour force figures released today for the month of May uh, were not unexpected. They continue to reflect the negative impact that COVID-19 is having on the labour market, but in particular uh, because of the survey period in which uh, the labour force figures are taken, which is the first two weeks of May, uh, they were actually taken in uh, the situation where uh, we had the height of the COVID-19 lockdown restrictions. Uh, Mr President, whilst it is clear that the economic fallout from COVID-19 will continue uh, for some time, the government has moved quickly to protect both the health and jobs of all Australians and put in place substantial measures to help cushion the impact of COVID-19. While today's ABS figures do uh, highlight the devastating effects of COVID-19, it is important to note, as the Leader of the Senate has stated, that Australia did enter this position and this uh, crisis from a position of economic strength and record employment. Total employment in Australia now stands at 12.15 12 million, and, uh, 12 million. The unemployment rate today has risen to 7.1 per cent. Mr President, every single job loss as a result of COVID-19 is devastating. But what it does highlight, as Minister Cormann has stated, is the imperative to open up our economy. The states need to open their borders. That is what now needs to happen, and the Prime Minister has been very, very clear in Order, this regard. Senator, Cash. Senator Molan, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Senator Watt. How are the government's uh, record economic stimulus measures supporting our economy, keeping Australians Order. in jobs, and building the lifeline businesses needed to endure the economic crisis created by COVID-19. Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, having flattened the health curve in relation to COVID-19, the Prime Minister has made it very clear. Uh, we are now fighting unemployment in Australia, and that is the very clear message that we can all take today from today's labour force figures. But, Mr. President, our priority, our number one priority as a government, is to support the economy to grow, and that is why we need all states, all states and territories, to open their borders, because that means that people uh, can start travelling, businesses can get back to work, and they can create more jobs for Australians. And that is what we are all about. But that is why, as a government, 
We have also invested a record $260 billion, equivalent to 13.3 per cent of GDP into the economy. Mr. President, the measures that we have implemented they have provided the essential support that many businesses have needed to get them through the COVID-19 crisis. Senator Molan, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, how will the government's five-year job maker plan chart a course for economic growth and recovery and create jobs for Australians? Senator Cash. Well, again, Mr. President, getting people back into jobs, ensuring that the economy is able to reopen uh, so that it can grow, that is where we need to start. And, Mr. President, as the Prime Minister outlined in his address to the National Press Club recently, our job maker plan it is critical to lift growth, not just for the next few months, not just for now, but we have a plan for Australians. We are going to bring them with us as we reopen the economy, and at least for the next five years. That's our job maker plan. Mr. President, in particular, we are going to be supporting skills and industrial relations reform. Why? Because we need this to improve our, workforce, our workplace productivity, but also to ensure that employers are getting the skilled workforce that they need. And of course, the great work that the Minister for Trade is doing in pursuing free trade agreements, building new relationships, giving more businesses the opportunity to Order. export Senator their jobs. Senator Cash, job. time for the answer has expired. Senator Stirl. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. And I refer to an article in today's Australian Financial Review entitled Old Jobs May Have to Go in PM's Recovery Plan. Minister, which are the old jobs that the PM has given up on? Senator Cormann. Th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. We haven't given up on any jobs. But you know what? We are, we are, not, we are not living in a socialist command control economy. I mean, jobs, jobs, jobs are generated by businesses around Australia, not by government. And the, and the Prime Minister is just being honest with the Australian people. And, and you know, I, I remember a former Prime Minister who's actually said something pretty similar. You know, on a, on a, on an, in an interview with Kerry O'Brien, I think his name was Paul Keating. You know, and when he was asked, oh, all these jobs that were lost when you reduced tariffs, what, what do you think about that? He said, you know what? But there were more new, better jobs as a result of economic reform. And you know what? What we are focused on is on more new, better jobs. I mean, there will be some jobs which will not come back, and it'll be better for the Australian people if they can find genuine, good quality jobs in a strongly recovering economy on the other side. That is, of course, what everyone in this chamber should want to see. We can't be looking backwards. Sadly, what happened has happened. It has been devastating. It's been difficult. And some businesses, some businesses, sadly, will not be able to recover. That is a fact of life. We can now try and pretend and lie to the Australian people. We will not do that. You go right ahead and pretend to the Australian people that through government edict, through socialist policies, that somehow you can preserve uh, every job in the economy no matter what. That is not the truth. In a free market economy, genuine jobs, genuine jobs will be created by genuine, viable, uh, profitable businesses, and that is what we want to see on the other side. Successful, profitable businesses that will hire more Australians again. Businesses that have the confidence to invest uh, in their future success because they know that the framework is right and that we got onto the other side of this crisis. We, can, we should never pretend to the Australian people that somehow governments can artificially uh, protect every single job in the economy in the context of the sort of crisis that we've just dealt with. So just think about it. Reflect on it. Paul Keating used to understand this. Clearly you guys have gone so far to the left that even Paul Keating would be ashamed of you now. Order. Senator Stirl, a supplementary question. I do. Thank you, Mr President. It is reported that the Morrison government is giving up on keeping Australians in their jobs and plans to shift them to job seeker in September. Minister, which of the three million Australians currently relying on JobKeeper has Mr Morrison given up on and is planning to force onto welfare? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. You clearly didn't listen to a single word I said in response to the primary question. Not a single word. We want every single Australian to have the best possible opportunity to get back into work, back into a job. We absolutely want every Australian to have the best possible opportunity to get back into work. But you know what? We are dealing with the economic impact of a one in a hundred year global pandemic. And Australia, comparatively speaking, is, is performing better than many others, uh, which, is, which is not to say that Australians aren't— Senator Wong on a point of order. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Point of order, direct relevance. Uh, the question was in relation. Order. I'd like to hear the point of order, Senator Wong. Appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the question was in relation to reports that the government is planning to shift people from job keeper to job seeker, on a day where we've seen nearly 830,000 Australians lose their jobs since March. We would like an answer to the question: Which of the three million Australians on job keeper is the government planning to shift onto welfare? Um, I would contend that it is a very broadly worded question, Senator Wong. I've allowed you to restate it, but a question that has what I might call somewhat language that is contestable can be answered in a similar fashion. I think the minister is being directly relevant given that. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. The truth is, and the Australian people understand, we are dealing with an incredibly difficult situation. Uh, we've had to provide crisis-level support to the economy, to business and to jobs, which uh, you know, was temporary uh, crisis-level support. There's two very significant decisions that we will have to make as a country uh, when it comes to the economic uh, on the economic front in the next uh, few uh, weeks and months. One is how to transition in the best possible way out of the uh, elevated level of crisis, the crisis level of temporary support to the economy in a way, in a way that, in a way that is, in a way that uh, ensures Order, that Australians Senator are not Coleman. left behind. Time and the other the answer has expired. Senator Stirl, a final supplementary question. Yeah, uh, yes, thank you, Mr. President. At the same time that Mr Morrison is forcing Australians off JobKeeper and onto JobSeeker, he is also cutting the rate of JobSeeker. Minister, can the government confirm that it is intending to force millions of Australians who are currently have jobs to live on as little as $40 a day from September? Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, it's always been very clear the uh, uh, crisis level uh, temporary support uh, through JobKeeper and the uh, enhanced job seeker payment, that is the, including the COVID uh, supplement, uh, is in place for six months. And we are currently, and Treasury is in the process of reviewing the uh, JobKeeper arrangements and also the interaction with JobSeeker. Uh, there will be decisions over the next uh, few weeks and over the next month or so in relation to how best to transition uh, out of the uh, temporary level of support, because ultimately the objective ought to be uh, that businesses around Australia are able to pay for their employees' wages out of their income rather than on the basis of tax uh, payer support. That is, that's got to be uh, the objective. But of course, we'll continue to make responsible decisions. And the next, uh, plan, the next part of it, of course, is we need to ensure we reform the policy setting such that we can have the strongest possible and most sustained possible recovery and economic growth trajectory on the other side. Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Through you, uh, President. Minister, yesterday, in question time, you said that the new rate of job seeker was, uh, under the coronavirus supplement was temporary and time limited, i.e. it finishes. Today, the media are reporting that job seeker will be permanently increased. Can you confirm the rate of job seeker and youth allowance will be permanently increased from the end of September? And when was this decision made, if that's the case? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Um, and I probably would caution uh, the senator opposite who asked the question um, to take her policy direction from the media. Perhaps she might like to listen to what I've said in here on successive occasions, but also the responses that have previously been uh, provided to the questions that have been asked of Senator Cormann. Uh, by, by the opposition, which have clearly outlined. Senator, on a point of order. Order, Senator yes, Seward. Have you concluded your answer? Sorry, have you concluded your answer, Senator? Senator Seward, on a point of order. Sorry, I can't. I honestly cannot ah. hear the minister's answer. You're not the only one, um, Senator Rustin. I, we've had a, a request from a colleague to be able to hear the answer, so I'm going to ask all senators to keep that in mind when they disorderly interject. Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President. As I was saying to, to Senator Seward um, when she didn't hear my response, was that um, the answers that have actually been provided in this place to um, the previous questions by Senator Cormann, I think, really clearly outline the responsible action that this government's taking to make sure that we put everything in place to support Australians through this coronavirus uh, pandemic. But at the same time, we have a responsibility to get our economy back going again to make sure that we can create the jobs, we'll get businesses back to work and we can create the jobs so that Australians who find themselves at the moment without work or on the JobKeeper payment are able Order, to get back Senator to work. Senator, see you on a point of order. 
point of order, this is information that we actually heard yesterday, most of it. I asked a specific question. Is, the case, is it the case that job seeker will now be permanently increased from the was, end of uh, September? That was the conclusion of your question, Senator Seward. Um, I believe the minister is being relevant, directly relevant to parts of the question. She's talking about the allowance. It may not be the question senators seek. There's an opportunity to debate that after question time. Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Well, as the Prime Minister um, has responded today at his press conference in relation to a very similar question that Senator Seward asked, is that um, the most important thing that we can do as, as a government is to make sure that we work to get the economy reopened. But what we won't do, what we won't do, Senator Seward, is get ahead of ourselves. And I think that's exactly what you're doing here. You're getting ahead of yourself and you're getting yourself overly excited about a report that was in the paper this morning. And, and look, Senator Seward, you've been here long enough to understand that you cannot always believe everything that you read in the paper. What you should do is you should take your policy direction from the answers that I give you when you ask me questions and perhaps take some note of what Senator Cormann has said uh, in response to a similar question that was asked by those opposite. And also maybe listen to the Prime Minister's press conferences like this morning when he did the conf uh, press conference with Senator Cash so that you can get a clear understanding straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak, about government policy. Senator C, what a supplementary question. Thank you. Is the minister saying that they are not going to be increasing the job seeker payment permanently, given that two media outlets, the West Australian and the Australian Financial Review, happened to, on the same day, conveniently run the same story? What? They weren't worded up? Um, Senator Rustin. Uh, well, um, <laughs> I mean, um, Mr. President, um, I have got no idea um, you know, what, what, what the basis of some of these uh, spurious stories are. But, but um, Senator, can I just say, can I, um, if you'd like order. to listen to my answer, Senator, I'm happy order. to give it to you. Senator Seward, you asked for <laughs> silence before. Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, and Senator Seward, as I said to the uh, answer to the previous question, um, you need to do probably two things, a bit of advice, two things. One is don't listen to everything that you read in the paper, and the other one is that really I prefer that you didn't verbal me. Much of what you say, uh, you come in here, is actually what you said yesterday, not what I said yesterday. Um, and so, what I would like to reiterate is that everything that I said to you yesterday, Senator Seward, I stand by. The coronavirus supplement that was put in place in March as a time-limited temporary payment to assist Australians who found themselves in a job market that basically closed overnight was a temporary measure. That remains the case. Senator Seward, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Um, I will take uh, you know, the minister's advice and I will reread those uh, question, the articles in the media. It seemed pretty, pretty clear to me, but they also articulated or said that the government is talking to backbenchers over dinner. Now I'm wondering whether the backbenchers are suggesting a rate to the government. Senator Rustin. Uh, Senator, thank, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, yeah, possibly. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And I just draw to the attention Order. of the chamber uh, that Somebody Senator Seward said that I had in the previous question told her to read what uh, it, to read the paper. I didn't actually say that. In fact, I said the contrary. I said, "Don't believe everything you read in the paper. Actually, listen to what." I respond to you in response to your uh, answers to your questions, and listen to Senator Corbyn and listen to the Prime Minister. Uh, now, in relation to uh, to who has dinner with who in the in the government, um, I have got uh, no idea. I'm, I'm sure we all have dinner with each other on a regular basis. But what I can say, Senator Seward, is this government takes very seriously our responsibility to look after Australians who are finding it very difficult at the moment because of the impact of the coronavirus pandemic has had on all Australians. I mean, we were all devastated to see the figures that Senator Cash had to announce this morning. Like she said, not unexpected, but nonetheless devastating. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr President. My, my question is to Senator, Senator Colbeck in his capacity as Health uh, Portfolio Minister and the Chair of the Australia-New Zealand Forum on Food Regulation. And I ask these questions on behalf of Senator Griff. I refer to the documents provided by Minister Colbeck and, and Little Proud in response to Senator Griff's order for production of documents on Fazan's uh, proposal for mandatory pregnancy warnings on packaged alcohol. 
The OPD shows uh, Minister Little Proud received advice from the Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment, which discusses industry concerns but still concludes, and I quote, the department is of the view that there is a lack of evidence to support concerns raised by the portfolio alcohol industries. Why did the federal government use its vote uh, in the Forum on Food Regulation to ask for ZANS to review its proposal because of concerns raised uh, from industry when even the department concludes that the industry's concerns are exaggerated? Uh, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President, um, and thanks, uh, Senator, for his question. Uh, and, uh, he raises a, uh, a very important issue, and uh, my colleagues sitting around the table with me at Food Ministers uh, had, as uh, Senators are aware, a very serious conversation with respect to this issue. We listened closely to uh, all perspectives but came to, and came to the view that the one thing that we did want to do as a result of uh, our considerations with respect to alcohol labelling was move to it from a situation where we had voluntary labelling on alcohol containers to a compulsory one. That was one of the decisions we made. But we also did consider some of the representations that had been made to us by a range of stakeholders, and we asked for Zants to, to do some additional work, which they're currently doing. Uh, and that for Zants will report back to us next week, uh, and there's another meeting of the Food Minister's Council uh, next month, which will, I hope, make a final decision to form compulsory labelling uh, for um, pregnancy warnings uh, on alcohol receptacles. I, I sincerely hope that that's the case, and that's the conversation that I have. I understand, Mr President, that Fazans, off the back of the meeting in March, has been back talking to all sides of this discussion, the medical professionals, those who are lobbying in respect of um, better management of alcohol labelling. Uh, around uh, FASD, because we all want to see the incidence of FASD stamped out completely. It's something that I think that we can do and we should do. Uh, that's why we are so firm in our view that there should be compulsory labels moving, uh, labelling, um, moving away from the circumstance of uh, the voluntary system that's in place right now. Uh, and so we will consider the report provided to us. Uh, by Fazans when we come to that meeting and hopefully make a final decision. Order. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Yeah, thank you. Um, you, uh, you know, uh, you've talked about meeting with stakeholders and so forth, but ultimately, uh, and, and you've suggested that you're going in a particular direction. But the OPD suggests that um, uh, that uh, the proposal, the cost proposals, were deemed, uh, and I quote an unreasonable cost uh, burden. Uh, the federal government represented one, only one of these votes, uh, yet it, uh, the uh, uh, forum has come to that conclusion. How did it come to that conclusion Order. and why did Senator you vote Patrick, that way? Senator Patrick, time for the questions expired. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, Senator Patrick is correct. The Commonwealth government has only one vote on that forum, uh, and that forum voted uh, by majority to ask Fazans to do some additional work. So, in other words, uh, the, Com the Commonwealth and enough states and territories made a decision to do some further work. I know that Fazans has been back to industry to check some of the figures that they provided with respect to uh, the potential uh, cost impact on them. Uh, that inf evidence will be provided, I'm certain, in the reporting that Fazans brings back to food ministers when it reports back to us formally uh, at later this month. Uh, that will be considered. Uh, as a part of the overall uh, discussion at Food Minister's meeting, um, and I think it's about the 21st of July. So, uh, my sincere hope is that once we get through the report that comes back from Fazant to Food Ministers, which is due next week, uh, once we consider that, we're in a position to be able to move to. Uh, Order, Senator Colbeck. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. Yes, um, thank you, Minister. Uh, Mr. President, um, Minister, you talk about engagement with a whole range of stakeholders. Yet the OPD suggests that you, you had there are only two meetings with uh, the alcohol industry, uh, one on the 27th of February and, and another on the 3rd of March. Uh, so uh, perhaps that doesn't contain all the information. Could you uh, provide the chamber, perhaps on notice, with all of the stakeholders with whom you've met, including health officials uh, and others uh, apart from industry? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm, I'm more than happy to provide uh, any further information I can to the chamber on notice. 
Uh, Mr. President, and, and I know uh, the, the comment that I made with respect to um, Fazan's going back to industry uh, and other stakeholders I know has been occurring because I've been talking to Fazan's over recent weeks uh, to, um, to understand where those negotiations uh, and those discussions have been, to understand some of the costs that have been supplied, particularly by industry, to Fazan's uh, and the justification of those costs. And I think that's an important thing for us as ministers to understand when, when we consider these matters. Uh, I do acknowledge the comments that uh, you've made, Senator, with respect to the cost of uh, FASD to the broader community and, and, and clearly without even justification of the costs that industry is putting up, the cost to society from FASD is way more, is way more uh, than the cost uh, to industry, and so that is something that seriously needs to be considered as part of our discussions. And as Order. I said, Senator Coffey, time for the answer has expired. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. The Morrison government has a proud record of supporting Australians with a disability to participate in the social and economic life of our nation. Can the minister advise the Senate as to how the government is driving our economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic and supporting people with autism to find and keep a job? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr President. Can I thank um, Senator Hughes for her question? Um, the Morrison government is absolutely committed to getting as many people with a disability into employment as we can. But despite the improvements that we've seen over the past seven years, there still remain many barriers uh, to employment for people who live with autism. Um, there are still way too many people with autism who are either unemployed or underemployed. And that's why, as part of the election campaign in 2019, we made a commitment to support people with autism to not just get a job, uh, to, to find a job, but to keep a job. So we know that people who live with autism um, have a wide range of strengths and skills, and we need to make sure that we get the message out to employers about the benefits that they can achieve for their businesses uh, and the long-lasting improvements that they can have in their businesses by employing people with, uh, with autism. And just last week, um, Senator Hughes uh, was part of an announcement uh, around funding for two new projects. Uh, that will encourage businesses to become autism-confident employers. Firstly, uh, Donut Bakery and Social Enterprise Crofney, um, along with Whitmer Advisors and Genu Training, have received $200,000 to work together to develop two accredited training programs uh, for the hospitality industry. So people with autism will be able to undertake training to help them navigate the fast-paced and often rapidly changing environment in a real-world situation. With more than 50 per cent of its workforce, people with intellectual disabilities, Crofty Bakery is a leader in the Canberra region for disability employment, and I know Senator Zed Zelger is a great supporter of this business and what they do. Um, but the Crofty Bakery started in the first place because the owner's son uh, has, autism, uh, has Down syndrome, um, and they decided that it was very, very important that their child had a meaningful, um, a meaningful job that, that he loved. So I'm reliably informed, not just uh, Order, by Senator Rustin. Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister update the Senate on the national expansion of the successful Dandelion project? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, we already know that, um, through our figures that there will be a growing number of young people leaving school uh, with autism, because the fact is that autism is the highest represented category in the NDIS. So. It's very important that this government continues to focus on helping this particular group of people successfully transition out of school and into employment. And that's why the Dandelion Project, which has been a fantastic success in conjunction with DXC Technologies, uh, will receive further funding of $1.5 million so that we can expand this particular project. So work's already commenced on developing a suite of autism-specific training tools for disability employment service providers and participants and employers, which will target disability employment service providers so that they can understand uh, the specific benefits of supporting people with autism into a work environment. Senator Hughes, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Minister Rustin, as a very confident autism employer. It's very much appreciated. 
How is the Disability Employment Service Program supporting Australians with a disability to find work in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Um, Disability Employment Service providers play a very, very important role in assisting people um, to get jobs uh, and to stay in jobs who live with disability. Um, and as part of the original um, in March announcements by the government in supporting people with disability and recognising the challenges that the COVID uh, crisis was going to present to them, we announced a $61 million funding package to support disability employment services to ensure that they were able to continue to provide the support to, uh, to people with disability through, the, through this unprecedented time. Um, so disability service providers um, are reporting strong numbers of people who are being placed into employment uh, and to be supported in jobs in excess of 26 weeks because we know we know that if we can get somebody into work for a longer period of time the chances of them remaining employment are so much higher than they otherwise would be Senator Ciccone. <clears throat> Thank you Mr President my question is to the minister representing the prime minister on Monday the prime minister and the minister said that the government would not be pursuing excessive austerity does the minister believe that forcing 3.5 million Australians off JobKeeper in September is excessive austerity? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator so, thank, you, thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, well, what we have done, what we have done over the uh, last few months, is provide a historic uh, crisis level fiscal support uh, to the economy, to business, uh, to working Australians, and indeed uh, to those Australians. Uh, who sadly lost their job. Uh, it's a program that's been put in place for uh, six months. This program has been put in place for six months. That was always very clear. This was a temporary program. But of course, we are considering very carefully on how we most appropriately transition uh, back into, uh, into a, a situation uh, more akin uh, to normal. And, and of course, the objective is to maximize the strength of the economic recovery on the other side. That is what we're focused on, to get as many Australians uh, back into work, to get as many jobs back as possible to get as many Australians back uh, into a, a genuine job uh, and, and indeed able to uh, earn a living and uh, ensure that uh, they have the best possible opportunity to get ahead. Uh, Australians can be absolutely confident that we'll make sensible decisions, uh, responsible decisions, as we have done throughout this crisis so far. And of course, when relevant decisions are made about next steps and the next phase, uh, we'll make uh, relevant announcements. Senator Ciccone, a supplementary question. Does the minister believe that removing the coronavirus supplement in September and forcing as many as 5 million Australians to live on as little as $40 a day is excessive austerity? Uh, Senator th Foreman. Th thank you very much, Mr President. I, mean, like, I would refer Senator, uh, the, Senator, the good senator to my uh, answer to the primary question. We are focused on making sure that we get as many Australians back into work as soon as possible. And of course, if some of these uh, states that are uh, persisting with state border closures were to, open some of these, were to open some of these borders, even more people would be able to get into work sooner. Uh, we, we need to ensure that we make the decisions today to maximise the strength of the economic recovery. Maximising the strength of the economic recovery will ensure that more Australians get back into work sooner. That is what all of us should be working on together. Senator Ciccone, a final supplementary question. Thank you, uh, Mr President. Does the minister believe that cuts to the pension, family payments, hospitals and schools, etc., in the 2014 budget were excessive austerity? Senator uh, thank you very much, Mr President. The 2014-15 budget helped ensure that we went into this crisis from a position of comparative fiscal strength. If we had made the hard decisions Order. over six years to, to uh, fix the mess that you guys left behind, we would have been in a weaker position to deal with this crisis. The Australian people know that it is thanks to the work of our government over the last six years, repairing the budget, repairing the absolute mess that you left behind, that we were in a Order. position to provide support uh, to the economy, to provide support Order. to business, to provide support uh, to those Australians uh, who are working for a business that is struggling through this period and indeed to provide unprecedented support uh, to those Watt. Australians uh, who lost their job. Uh, the, I, mean, I, I can't believe that the Labor Party Tactics Committee in the Senate would be so brazen to ask such a question. What Senator Watt. When clearly it is now proven how important it was that we did the hard yards fixing the fiscal mess that you guys Order. left behind. Order. Order. 
Senator Canavan. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Cash. Can the Minister outline to the Senate how the Liberal National Government's infrastructure pipeline, including the Roads of Strategic Importance program, is supporting Australian jobs and assisting Order. regional communities, businesses and producers in their post-pandemic recovery? Order on my left before I call the Minister. The Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Canavan for the question. And as Senator Canavan well knows, the Liberal National Government, uh, we support rural and regional Australia because that is exactly what is in our DNA. In terms of our commitment to regional transport infrastructure, uh, Senator Canavan, you'd be aware that since 2013-14, it now totals, Mr. President, more than $30 billion. $30 billion. And this is, of course, delivering real outcomes for regional communities. What's it doing? It's improving roads and rail to better connect regional communities. Uh, Mr. President, programs which regional Australia is benefiting from include the Black Spot Program, Roads to Recovery, the Bridges Renewal Program, Heavy Vehicle Safety and Productivity Program, and of course, as Senator Canavan has referred to, the $4.5 billion Roads of Strategic Importance Initiative. Mr President, this program, the government's Roads of Strategic Importance Initiative, is a major program for supporting and developing the transport networks across key corridors in regional Australia. The program itself primarily supports network improvements, which involves packages of investment to raise the standards of the road, including feeder roads, to provide more reliable road networks. The corridor approach provides a more reliable road network, improves access for higher capacity vehicles, better connects regional communities and, of course, facilitates tourism opportunities. And those, are, those tourism opportunities would be further facilitated if, obviously, states would actually open up and territories um, their borders. But, Senator Canavan, in terms of Queensland in particular, it's benefiting now from over one billion dollars of committed funding under the Roads of Strategic Importance initiative, and this includes key investments including the Mount Isa to Rockhampton corridor upgrade and the Townsville to Royda corridor upgrade. Senator Canavan, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Great news from the Minister. Can the Minister also inform the Senate of how projects like the Yapoon rockhampton Road duplication and the sealing of the Springshaw tambo Road will increase safety and boost tourism for these communities? Senator Cash. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. President. And as Senator Canavan would be aware, the government has committed $64 million to the Yapoon Rockhampton Road duplication. And this project will deliver targeted upgrades, including duplicating sections of Yapoon Road. In terms of the project and what it is expected to deliver, increased economic productivity by reducing costs to industry through better network efficiencies. It will improve road safety by reducing unsafe overtaking and the associated risks of head-on collisions. And it will also increase route capacity to accommodate future growth in traffic volume through increases in economic activity in the region. Mr President, regarding the Springshaw to Tambo project that Senator Canavan raised, this is another great example of the investment by the Liberal National Government where we have committed $40 million which will directly support local producers. Uh, Mr President, we understand that this type of investment will assist Order, regional Senator Australia. Cash. Senator Canavan, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Can the minister inform the Senate of what can be done to fast-track many of those great road projects you've mentioned under programs like the Roads of Strategic Importance pro program and to inject money, much-needed money, into regions hurt by the COVID-19 pandemic and help local communities? Senator Cash. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. President. And uh, the government, the Liberal National Government, we understand that we need to work closely with states and territories uh, to fast track infrastructure where and when possible. In fast tracking infrastructure, you create jobs, as with our recent announcement in terms of creating around 66,000 jobs. On the 29th of April, the Deputy Prime Minister announced works to seal roads, build overtaking lanes, upgrade intersections, and improve safety. We'll start sooner rather than later under an agreement reached between the Australian and the Queensland governments on, the twen on 22 jointly funded regional road projects worth, Senator Canavan, $185 million. Mr. President, these early work projects will be delivered on corridors identified 
under the roads of strategic importance initiative. And of course, delivering early works through this initiative will give regional Queensland communities access to new projects and, of course, much needed jobs. Order, Senator Cash. Senator Ayres. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. ABS figures show that payroll jobs in the accommodation and food services sector fell by nearly 30 per cent since March. Before COVID-19, more than 4,200 people in Eden Monero worked in cafes, restaurants and accommodation in towns like Bega, Murrum Bateman, Tumut and Queanbeyan. Can the minister confirm how many of these 4,200 jobs are old jobs that Mr Morrison has given up on? Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, Mr President. I would just uh, again say that I reject the premise of that final part of the question. We want every single Australian to have the best possible opportunity to get back into work. Back into work. And let me say, let me say that of course the uh, food and accommodation services have been particularly hard hit. We are dealing with a one in a hundred year global pandemic with devastating impacts all around the world, including here in Australia. But we are, we are performing comparatively better than other parts of the world. But let me say, let me say, I mean, you talk about tourism and hospitality services across Eden Monero. They would be in so much better a position if only the Queensland State Labor government uh, opened those state borders and those people from Brisbane who want to go into the snow in Eden Monero could go in. Or, sorry, I was taking advice from your whip. Senator Watt? Point of order. Point of order on relevance. It seems the minister needs to be reminded that Eden Monero is not in Queensland. Um, it's in New sorry, South Wales. Um, I was, I, I, look, uh, to be order. I'm not going to. I'm not going to rule on the point of. I, to be fair, I was I, not listening at that point. I was taking advice from one of the whips. I will continue to listen to the minister's answer. Um, Senator Cormann. Uh, it, it is very clear that those socialists over there don't understand about the implications of closed state borders. A closed state borders means that Queenslanders are restricted from going into the snow in Eden Monero when, w without going back into quarantine for a couple of weeks. Order. But, oh, oh, I mean, clearly, you know, this, Order. Is, this is why the Labor Party always stuffs up the economy, because they don't understand these basic facts that closed borders actually restrict restrict economic activity. Economic activity. Order. There would be more jobs in Eden Monero, more jobs Order in Eden Monero if the people Senator of Brisbane Watt, could Senator go to the snow in Threadpool, in Threadpool. And indeed, if they could go to all Order. these fantastic restaurants and accommodation facilities all around the city of Eden Monero, it is the state Labor government in Queensland that is holding uh, those uh, jobs back. And quite frankly, the state Labor government in Queensland should open those borders now. Order. I'm going to ask senators on both sides to not to take their breath and count to ten or I will, when I start naming them and calling them to order. On my right as well. Senator Ayres, easy back there, supplementary Jerry. question. Always somebody else's fault. Retail expert Queensland University of Technology professor Gary Mortimer has warned that many retailers may not reopen once support is removed. He said, quote, retailers will see this as a chance to cut off the dead wood in their networks. How can the more than 7,000 sales assistants, hospitality and retail managers in towns like Queanbeyan, Jindabyne, Cooma or Eden tell if they have one of the old jobs that Mr Morrison Order. has turned Senator his back Ayers. on? Senator Cormann. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Even for a socialist, that is twisted logic. That is twisted logic. You know what? I mean, people in shops uh, will get their jobs back when consumers go back into those shops to buy products. That is what's, that's, that's how you get jobs back. I mean, somehow he seems to think that by government edict you can sort of pop up these jobs and people, what, they sit on their chair? Like, I mean, you know, clearly we want, we want the economy to recover as strongly as possible. We want businesses to be back in business and successful and profitable and viable as soon as possible. We want businesses to have confidence to invest and hire more Australians again. But it's got to be on the basis of genuine activity, not because the government somehow provides an easy. Senator Watt. Not because provide some sort of uh, edict that, that sort of says this now shall be a job. I mean, there's, there's got to be, I mean, in a free market economy, there's a bit more to it. And our government is making sure that we've got the best possible policy settings in place to ensure that people all around Australia, including in Eden Monero, have the best possible opportunity to get back into work if they've lost their job and indeed Order. to remain Senator in work Corman, if they have a job. Senator time for the answers expired. Senator Ayres, a final supplementary question. 
Before COVID-19, one in 10 workers in the capital region were out of work or looking for more work. Before COVID-19. How can the Australian people trust the government to manage the recovery when regional Australians were already being left behind before the pandemic? Senator Corbyn. Thank you very much, Mr President. When we came into government in 2013, we inherited a weakening economy, rising unemployment, a rapidly deteriorating budget position. We worked Order very hard for six left. years to turn that situation Senator around. Keneally, but of Senator Keneally. Work record, rec record workforce participation, a, a, a lower unemployment rate. I mean, your Senator unemployment Watt. rate was headed to pass six and a quarter per cent. How order, do I Senator know Corman, I've got Senator Wong on a point of order. Uh, Mr. President, again, on a day we've had nearly a quarter of a million Australians lose their job, bringing the, bring the numbers to 835,000 since March. I think people. Uh, in this region deserve this minister answering the question rather than a political rant? Um, I, I, with, with respect, I, I'm not sure. I, I think the minister, given the, the tone of the question, is actually being relevant, although I might add that just, I could barely hear him over my shouting for order. And I'll ask senators to remain quiet so that I may rule on future points of order. Senator Th Corbyn. Thank you very much, uh, Mr uh, President. The people in Ian Monero, in, in particular in Queanbeyan, who are quite close to what happens in Canberra, know the mess that you guys left behind, a weakening economy, rising unemployment and a rapidly deteriorating uh, budget position. They know that we worked hard to turn the situation around and they know that we went into this crisis which came to us uh, from, an exter from external factors, they know Order. that we are in a comparatively strong opposition because of the work that we've Senator done over Wong. the last six years. And, and indeed, and indeed they know that we will continue Wong. to make the responsible decisions. We will continue to make the responsible decisions moving forward to ensure that every Order. Australian Senator has the best Coleman, possible opportunity to get the answer has expired. Senator Davey. Thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Communications, Cyber Safety and the Arts, Senator Reynolds. How is the Liberal and Nationals in government supporting jobs and economic recovery for regional and rural Australians, including by improving telecommunications access through the mobile black spot program? The Minister representing the Minister for Communications, Cyber Safety and the Arts, Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Davey for the question. And I also commend her for her commitment to rural and regional Australia. Uh, the Morrison McCormick government recognises the vital importance of mobile phone coverage to, Australia's, to Australians living, working, and travelling in regional and remote parts of our great nation. That's why we're delivering on a commitment to improve mobile coverage across Australia through our $380 million investment in mobile spot, black, uh, spots. The first five rounds of this program are funding for over 1,200 mobile base stations across Australia. Over 80, eight, sorry, 800 base stations have been activated and are now delivering real benefits to regional and rural communities right across Australia. The Eden Monero communities of Rosewood, Forbes Creek and Yass River Road are examples of how these base stations are delivering better coverage for all Australians. 34 mobile base stations have been funded in Monaro under the first five rounds of the Mobile Black Spot program. 22 of these base stations have been completed and are now providing coverage to residents in the electorate. In addition to the 380 million Mobile Black Spot program, we are also delivering $60 million to the Regional Connectivity program. But, Mr. President, there is yet more. Oh. Oh. Uh -huh. yeah. Other initiatives to improve telecommunications for all Australians include a community focused telecommunications grants round, a digital technical hub to provide additional advice and assistance to Australians in regional and remote areas, and also trials of alternative technologies that will provide voice telephony services in remote areas. These initiatives are all yet further evidence of the coalition government's unwavering commitment to Australians who live and work in regional, rural and remote areas of our great nation. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Thank you. In the wake of the summer bushfires, what is our government doing to strengthen the resilience of telecommunications networks in these regional areas? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Mr President. As part of this government's $650 million bushfire recovery package announced last month, 
We are investing over $37 million to strengthen telecommunications resilience uh, in bushfire and disaster-prone areas across our nation. This will ensure that individuals and communities in regional areas of Australia can stay connected during emergencies. Our investment in the uh, telecommunications emergency resilience package contains three key measures to address telecommunications outages during natural disasters. Firstly, $18 million to upgrade backup power and also backhaul for mobile base stations and other telecommunications infrastructure. Secondly, $10 million for portable facilities that mobile carriers and also NBN Co will deploy to address temporary coverage gaps caused by power outages. And thirdly, $7 million to install NBN satellite connections at 2,000 rural fire Order. depots Senator and Reynolds, evacuation centres. The answer has expired. Senator Davey, a final supplementary question. And finally, to support regional Australians like me through the COVID-19 pandemic, how is the National Broadband Network helping people in these regional and remote areas to stay connected? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, the Coalition Government is working very closely with NBN Co to ensure that all regional Australians stay connected during this very challenging period. NBN Co is providing an additional 45 gigabytes of data for each standard SkyMuster plan until the end of August. This effectively doubles the average monthly data limit. They have also established a $150 million financial relief and assistance fund to support customers affected by the pandemic. This, also, this includes $50 million to help low-income households with school-aged children to access the internet. And Mr President, these initiatives are working. There are now more than 100,000 Australian homes and also businesses who are now receiving faster broadband over SkyMuster satellite services. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, President. And my question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. Minister, is there a difference between after tax and before tax? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, uh, Mr. Mr. President, thanks, Senator Walsh, for the question. Um, there is, there is clearly, there is Order, clearly a difference between uh, after tax and before tax. I mean, I think that would be a statement of the obvious, uh, but it doesn't mean not subject to tax. <laughs> Senate Order, Senator Walsh, a supplementary question. Minister, in your media release of 20 March 2020, you state that the retention bonus for aged care workers is a payment of up to either $800 for direct care workers or $600 for in-home care workers after tax. However, the fact sheet on your department's website says these payments are before tax. Minister, how can both of these be correct? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, uh, as I said uh, in my answer to Senator Walsh's primary question, it does not say it, that it does not mean not subject to tax. And Mr. President, as I've said in this chamber on a number of occasions this week, and Senator Order. Walsh has acknowledged in her questions uh, a number of times herself, uh, the the commitment that this government made to aged care workers, which I might say, Mr. President, is the only. A group within the Australian economy that have received specific support through the COVID-19 uh, circumstance in acknowledgement of their importance to managing of uh, COVID-19 within the aged care sector would be up to, up to $800 and up to $600 for those working in home care. And it's very, very important uh, to acknowledge that fact, Mr President. We've always said up to those numbers, and in fact, it's a significant contribution to aged care workers of $1,600 up Order, to $1,600 and up to $1,200. The answer has expired. Senator Walsh, your final supplementary question. Minister, I refer to a worksheet on the tax office website designed for high school students in years 7 to 10. Minister, using this worksheet and applying it to a residential aged care worker working more than 30 hours per week, being paid at level four of the award. Isn't it the case that the worker will be $260 worse off during Australia's first recession in 29 years because of your decision? Senator Colbeck. 
Well, Mr. President, the, the circumstance of any individual worker uh, and their taxation um, liabilities will depend on their individual circumstances, Mr. President. And so uh, I, don't pretend, I don't pretend to be able to calculate an individual's uh, taxation circumstances, uh, depending, Mr. President. Order, on Senator Colbeck. I've got Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator well, Wong. Point of order. At which point does this minister take any responsibility? That's not a point of order, Senator Wong. The minister to continue, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And, and as, so, as I've said, Mr. President, the individual tax circumstances of any worker working, whether it's in aged care or any other industry across the country, will be, de will be de determined by their individual circumstances. By their individual circumstances. Senator Scar. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Can the minister inform the Senate how Australia is working with the Pacific Islands Forum, our Pacific family, to respond to pressing challenges in the region, including the COVID-19 pandemic and its economic impacts? Senator, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Scar for his interest and uh, the question. Uh, Australia, with our Pacific family, uh, has swiftly and effectively responded to the health impacts of COVID-19. And our Pacific regional institutions have been absolutely central to this response. And yesterday I joined uh, PIF colleagues for the inaugural virtual meeting uh, of the Ministerial Action Group for the COVID-19 Humanitarian Pathway. The meeting with my counterparts from Tuvalu, who chaired the meeting, Cook Islands, Fiji, the Marshalls, Nauru, New Zealand, Tonga and Vanuatu, and also key regional organisations such as the Pacific Community, uh, the Forum Fisheries Agency, the University of the South Pacific, the Pacific Immigration Development Community and the Oceania, Oceania Customs Organisation, discussed the movement of essential supplies and humanitarian uh, support and personnel in the COVID-19 context. We have strongly supported the Pacific Humanitarian Pathway Initiative uh, of the PIF since its inception. And forums like yesterday are a concrete example of collaboration in the region to find that collaborative solution to the pressing health, social and economic challenges from the, uh, co from the pandemic. To illustrate the challenge, perhaps, Mr President, when ministers first met to discuss the pathway, there were 1.2 million confirmed cases of COVID-19 worldwide. Today, there are over 8 million. So our strong collaborative response has been vital to helping the region keep infection rates as low as possible. There are currently 322 cases in the Pacific, thanks in part to this excellent cooperation and to the efforts of those governments. And our two largest Pacific neighbours, Papua New Guinea and Fiji, have both gone at least 42 days without a confirmed case, which is very, very important in the minimising of transmission and infection rates. Senator Scar, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister advise what were the practical outcomes from yesterday's meeting of the Pacific Humanitarian Pathway Ministerial Action Group? The practical outcomes for Australia and the region. Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And we were very pleased to endorse an important set of regional protocols for deploying personnel for customs and biosecurity, for immigration, and for repatriations. And that will help a lot with clearance of aircraft, clearance of ships that are transporting medical, humanitarian, and technical assistance. The protocols are also going to support the safety of technical personnel for critical responses. That might include Australian medical and logistics experts, for example, in the Solomon Islands, in Papua New Guinea and in Fiji. The Pathway Chair, who is Tuvalu's Foreign Minister, Simon Coffey, recognised Australia's support to the World Food Programme and the World Health Organisation Pacific Joint in Incident Management Team, uh, which are both central to the regional response to, uh, to COVID-19. understand the joint team has received over 350 assistance requests and deployed 40 technical experts across the Pacific to support the collaborative effort in addressing COVID-19. Senator Scar, a final supplementary question. Could the minister advise the Senate on the impact of COVID-19 on the Pacific Labor Scheme? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. The Pacific Labor Scheme is very important to Australia and it's important to our Pacific neighbours. It allows Australian employers to fill labour gaps and it allows Pacific workers to earn remittances to send home to their families. Like others, Pacific Island workers have had their lives, their work, disrupted by COVID-19. There are over 1,000 PLS workers in Australia and for those who have lost jobs, 
We have been working hard to help them find new employment or to arrange their safe return home. We've provided all relevant health advice and guidance on COVID-19 restrictions and other support, including pastoral care and Pacific language information on COVID-19 responses. Mr. President, I am concerned by recent reports about the situation of some Pacific Islanders under the scheme. We are working closely with approved employers, with Pacific governments and with communities to safeguard the welfare of these workers. Senators opposite have also raised this issue, and I want to assure them and to assure the community that the government is committed to Order. rectifying Payne, these issues in a successful and safe PLS. Has expired. Senator Cormann. Uh, I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Uh, if I could ask senators to pause for a moment. Um, senators, as some of you may be aware, today marks the last occasion on which the Senate attendant team will be led by Chief Senate Attendant John Brown. John joined the Senate Department in November 2005 after working as a parliamentary security guard from 2001. Prior to working for the parliament, John served in the Royal Navy and then the Royal Australian Navy. In 2001, John received the Medal of the Order of Australia in the Queen's Birthdays Honours List for his meritorious service to the Australian Defence Force. Since 2005, John has served five presidents, Paul Calvert, Alan Ferguson, John Hogg, Stephen Parry and myself, and three clerks in Harry Evans, Rosemary Lang and Richard Pye, as well as five ushers of the Black Rod. John has also been present for five openings of the parliament and the initial swearing in of three governors general and 112 senators. All of us have first-hand experience of John's enthusiasm and dedication to his role and his leadership of the attendance team. Whether being especially welcome to new senators, preparing the chamber flags, ringing the bells to commence the day, locking the doors for divisions, or launching chamber documents through the pneumatic tubes, John has performed his role with pride and to the highest possible standards. I am sure that all senators will join me in thanking John for his outstanding service to the Senate and wishing him a long and leisurely retirement. Yeah. Yeah. Senator Cormann. Uh, th th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I seek leave to make some remarks supporting uh, your statement. Leave is granted. Senator Cormann. Uh, Mr. President, it's not often that we're able to pause and reflect. And you know, when we do, we do remind ourselves what an amazing privilege it is for us to be able to serve the Australian people here uh, and to serve our country on their behalf. And it's our great honour as elected representatives, but that honour is not just ours. I mean, there are many people in this place who serve the Australian people, perhaps in a less public uh, and generally um, less noticed way by the broader public. And John Brown is one of those very important uh, key people uh, who has made such an amazing contribution uh, in this place uh, for such a long time. For almost two decades, John has worked tirelessly in this place, giving outstanding service to the Australian Parliament. So as he prepares to leave this place and begin a well-earned retirement, far from any ringing bells, <laughs> let us acknowledge John and his service. Nineteen years ago, John came here to work as a parliamentary security guard, as the President just mentioned. He walked this hallways from 2001 before joining the Department of the Senate uh, in 2005. And it is in this capacity, as I a chamber supervisor that John has provided diligent, efficient and unfailingly courteous service to everyone in this place. So much so, um, he once played a starring role, as I understand it, uh, from some of his colleagues in an ABC documentary about his team's role in the operation of this chamber. Um, some of us are still trying to work it all out. <laughs> He has served five presidents, three clerks of the Senate and five ushers of the Black Rod. And, and I don't know how many uh, leaders of the opposition and leaders of the government uh, were here during that period, probably too many to mention. <coughs> uh, John has seen five openings of parliament swearing in of three governors general and 112 senators, and these numbers um, clearly speak for themselves. 
John is a pillar of the Senate and all of us have greatly benefited from his support. Be it directly or indirectly, he has helped make the work we do here possible and for that we owe him a great deal. We could all pause more often to acknowledge people like John because people like him make this place tick and enable us to do the job we do on behalf of the Australian people. While many of us may be familiar with John's work in this place, <coughs> his service to Australia began long before he arrived here. John spent many years in the Royal Navy and then the Royal Australian Navy, serving with such distinction he received an Order of Australia medal in 2001 for his meritorious service to the Australian Defence Force. So on behalf of the government, uh, I would like to express our gratitude for John's dedication and service uh, in the Senate and to our country. He is an unsung hero of this chamber who leaves an indelible mark and we wish him a happy and healthy retirement, much of which uh, I'm reliably informed he will spend at the wheel of his beloved MX5. <laughs> Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I also seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted. I thank the Senate. Uh, and I also rise on behalf of opposition senators to speak on the occasion <coughs> of John Brown's last day in the Senate. Uh, John has served us here for many years didn't quite make 20. Uh, all but 13 months of that time as supervisor, and he has led uh, chamber attendants, the team of chamber attendants per, per superbly, and he has served this extraordinary, extraordinary institution with great distinction. We do rely on chamber attendants. They ensure this place actually runs, from circulation to amendment, of amendments to guarding the doors and all the many tasks behind the scenes that uh, many do not appreciate. They walk that tightrope between providing us with assistance but not straying into the spotlight. They're here well before most others arrive on a sitting day and are packing up after most have left. John, you've brought great discipline and unity to the team of chamber attendants, and I think that is reflected by the pride in which they do their work. You've led by example, unfailingly courteous, respectful and cheerful and you've demonstrated a great ability to have the attendants working as a team. They do us, the Senate, and you proud. Of course, as Senator Cormann says, John's abilities were recognised well beyond the walls of the chamber before. He, he had more than a little role, a starring role, in Annabel Crabbe's documentary about the operation of Parliament House. Uh, John's is a life of service to the nation. Some 30 years of service in the Royal Australian Navy and nearly 20 years in this place, and we thank you for this. John is a man who I'm told likes his machines, especially his cars, and I'm reliably advised owns one of the best set of wheels in the Senate car park. When we had a chat about his retirement plans, he told me one of the plans he has for the future is to drive across the Nullarbor. I thought that might be a little monotonous, monotonous, but then I figured you'd sat through 20 years of the Senate, so you'll be fine. <laughs> Uh, well, John has been the captain of the Senate ship for two, nearly two decades. I say on a personal note, uh, certainly the entirety of my period in the Senate to date, uh, we will miss you. Your great pride in serving serves as an, as an example to all of us, because walking onto this, the floor of this Senate is a privilege, and it is one you have always honoured. So we thank you and we wish you well. Yeah. Yeah. Senator Seward. I seek leave to make some short remarks. Leave is granted. Um, I'd like to associate the Greens with the comments of the President, the Leader of the Government and the Leader of the Opposition in the Chamber and add ours. And say thank you for your years of dedicated service. You have been here more than most of the Senators That's in true. this Chamber right now. Um, so you've seen a You've seen a lot <laughs> go on in this place. Um, those of us that have had to sign documents remember your gold pen. And I think we're about to see it. The famous gold pen that we always sign our bills and anything else we have to sign with when you are requiring us to sign. <laughs> it takes a particular kind of dedication to continue to work in this place for so long. 
and you have mentored many other many attendants in this place as well, who also follow your dedication and your um, support and guidance uh, in this place. Um, we wish you uh, the best, um, and I also understand that you are going to uh, be spending a lot more time with your grandchildren. Something that I can deeply understand. Um, I would like to just add, though, drive across to Nullarbor. I have done it many times. Ignore Senator Wong's comments about it being boring. It is glorious, um, particularly as it leads to my home state. We all wish you well um, into the future. Yes. Yeah. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And I uh, also, on behalf of the National Party, senators past and present, um, associate all of us um, from Bozzy, Barnaby, Nigel, everybody, um, all their teams, with you and your team's support for us. Uh, your warm, genuine um, service has reminded us of home. We're often far from home. Um, and just thank you for the patriot that you are. You served our country in the Defence Force and here in a very different type of service. Um, you live that every Day. So um, you, your ability to decipher weird hand gestures, <laughs> let Hansard show, um, lectern, um, I need the EM, the bills. So um, just thank you for that um, capacity and for sharing that. And so on behalf of all National Party senators, past and present, John, have an awesome time. Spend lots of time out in the regions and you'll always find uh, open arms to have a quiet sherbet and a chat. Senator Hanson. Seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted. I won't say too much. I think it's all been said, and I concur with my colleagues and what they've said with regards to, to John. Um, I was very saddened when I heard of his retirement today because I remember every day that I walk in here and I see his face and I see the smile on his face, and I think it's just a pleasant attitude that someone has in doing their work as if they're really happy to come to work. I don't necessarily have that every day. <laughs> but anyway, but it's nice to see it in someone else's face. Um, you know, um, John mentioned he wants to get over to Margaret River. He hasn't been there. I hope he gets there. So, the, no, so and to other beautiful places in the country, you've got to come up to Queensland. Some fantastic places there as well. I just hope you have a very healthy, happy, long retirement with your grandchildren, with your wife, and and with your family. And I'm just terribly jealous because after so many years in this chamber and working here, you probably know a hell of a lot more than I do in procedures <laughs> than what most of us possibly do in this chamber. So I wish you could trans you know, transfer that to me. But um, I think you've enjoyed your time here, watching the politics of it and seeing what's happened. And I think you're going to take a lot of um, wisdom with you. And it's been an absolute honour, my being here, to be served by you and your staff. So thank you very much. I th I, uh, Senator Theravanti Wells. Thank you. I seek leave to make a very short statement. Um, John, can I just, on leave a personal. Granted. Thank you. John, on a personal note and on behalf of my husband, John Wells, under whom you served when he was commanding officer of HMAS Tobruk, can I just place on record um, our congratulations to you, our thanks for your service, not just in this place, but in the Royal Australian Navy. Uh, you were um, a loyal servant uh, in Her Majesty's Navy, and I know that you take very, you took great pride in that service. So on behalf of my husband, John, and I thank you and best wishes for the future. Thank you. Well, um, I thank senators for their contributions and their observation of them. Are there any notices to take note of answers? Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answer given by Senator Cormann to the question asked by Senator Gallagher. Thank you. Uh, of course, today we saw some really Order. we saw some deeply horrifying statistics today uh, come out about the state of unemployment in our country. Uh, today, what we found out uh, was that unemployment in Australia has hit 7.1 per cent, the highest unemployment rate we have seen in Australia for nearly 20 years. Uh, and those figures can be measured in so many different ways. Uh, what it means is that just in one month, 
uh, we saw 227,000 Australians lose their jobs. And of course, that comes on the back of more and more job, job losses that had occurred in Australia uh, after COVID-19 hit uh, in the early months of this year. What we've seen in total since March is the loss of 835,000 jobs uh, across Australia. That's far more than just a set of numbers. That's families without income, that's graduates without career prospects, that's skills going down the drain, unable to be used. There were so many shocking statistics re uh, revealed today about the state of unemployment in Australia. Uh, what we know is that in, just in the month of May alone, we saw 2.3 million Australians either lose their jobs or working hours. Uh, in addition to the 7.1 per cent of Australians who are now unemployed, we have a record high 20.2 per cent uh, number of Australians who are underemployed, who want more work than they can find, but who are unable to find uh, that level of work that they're looking for. Terrible statistics again for youth unemployment, for the number of women who've lost their jobs, for the male participation rate. Pretty much in every way you look at it, these unemployment figures are incredibly bleak. Uh, and the most worrying thing is that these numbers are set to get worse. And not just as some sort of coincidence, not because of uncontrolled events, not just because of COVID-19, but because of decisions that this government is actively making to hold back support to Australians that desperately need it. It's as a result of this government's own decisions that this unemployment rate has got so high and is set to get worse, and that we will see so many Australians struggle in the months ahead. You really have to think about this government's priorities, that due to these, this data being released today, what we now know is that more than one in four Australians is either unemployed or underemployed. And yet all this government can talk about is about cutting back on JobKeeper and JobKeeper support. So rather than actually being out there working day and night desperately to get people into work, this government's priority at a time when unemployment and under, underemployment has never been so high, this government's priority is to work out ways that it can scale back support. And that is exactly the kind of excessive austerity that this Prime Minister has said that he won't engage in, but he and his backbench are preparing to engage in, that is going to hold this country back and make survival so much harder for so many Australians. Now, I wish that in the coming weeks, as this government has got important decisions to make, that it actually listens to some of its more sensible backbenchers, particularly from my home state of Queensland, who are saying that JobKeeper and JobSeeker need to be extended. This is going to be an incredibly important test of this government over coming weeks to see whether it adopts pragmatic measures that will keep Australians in work, that will keep uh, money in the homes of Australians, or whether it follows its traditional ideology and cut back, cuts back on that support. And we have seen so many disturbing signs that this government is not going to be able to avoid its ideological uh, blueprint. Uh, just today, we see the, the Prime Minister saying uh, that old jobs may have to go. So rather than actually working day and night to make sure that all of the jobs that we've lost uh, this year get restored, this Prime Minister is already giving up on a whole heap of jobs. You know, what are the old jobs that may have to go? Are they the retail workers? Are they the hospitality workers? Are they the manufacturing workers? Are they the mining workers? Are they the aged care workers, the disability care workers? Labor will not stop. Labor will not give up on jobs, and we will keep fighting Thank for those you, jobs Senator. to be restored. Thank you, Senator. While your time has expired, I remind senators that we do have a hard marker at 3.30. Senator Davey. Thank you very much. And I rise to take note of Senator Watt's take note. And I thank Senator Watt for giving me the opportunity to explain what our priorities are, because our priority is exactly to address the issue that Senator Watt raised. Yes, it is dreadful that the unemployment figures are high. But let's face it, 
We have gone through a global pandemic like never seen before. When we compare the impacts our economy has felt to those of other nations around the world, we have actually come out of this relatively well. I don't deny that the unemployment figures are devastating. But what I will say is that our government is very well placed to address that. Our job maker plans are to get Australia employed again, to get Australia moving again, to help rebuild our economy. And we're doing it because we have an eye on the future. We have announced that we are commencing formal negotiations with, the Brit with Britain for a free trade agreement. That will open up markets. That will help us to broaden our export capacity, which helps our regional employment. We can get our agricultural produce into Britain. If we can do that directly, it will be a fantastic outcome for regional Australia. We are fast-tracking infrastructure spending. That is jobs. That is jobs in construction. That is jobs in the regions. That is jobs in our states. And I cannot believe that those on the other side shake their heads at our plan to build infrastructure. That's what they've been telling us to get on with and do for the last few years. We're doing it. We are getting on with the job of getting people back in employment. We, today, today we're about to pass a national skills commissioner that is designed to identify the skills gaps across our country and develop the education and training programs so that people are job ready and job fit. And this, is, this can only be a good thing. The Prime Minister has committed to a plan to lift economic growth over the next five years by more than one percentage point above trend to beat the expected pre-COVID-19 GDP by 2025. We have a plan. We've got an economic plan. We've got a job maker plan. And we are committed to working on that to deliver it. All levels of government, business and the community must rethink how these systems can better to contribute to our recovery from this pandemic. Senator Watt talks about what old jobs are we turning our back on. Well, we're not turning our back on any old jobs, but what we are embracing is the need to adapt. Our economy needs to adapt, our job markets need to adapt, and we are embracing that ad adaptation. We are not about stagnating this nation. We are not about relying on the old. We are about rising to the challenges of the future rebuilding our economy and getting on with the job of getting Australians back into a job. And I, I will not apologise for the commitment that this government, the government I am part of, has to getting people employed again. We need to bring common sense and cooperation back into this debate. We showed fighting COVID-19 to unlocking infrastructure and investment is part of the recovery process. Let's not forget Australia entered the COVID-19 crisis from a position of economic strength. That is strength that this government was able to create. Had those on the other side been in government, I dread to think what would have happened and how we would have been able to afford to address this pandemic. To minimise the economic impacts and the position and position our economy to recover on the other side of the crisis, we have provided $260 billion in financial support for the economy. That's around 13.3 per cent of the GDP. And we are now reviewing where we are at right now. It is appropriate that we take the time to review it. We're not preempting the outcome of that review. The Treasurer will update everyone in July, and that is the right thing to do. We need to take time to review the position we're at and move forward. But I am very proud of our position, the position our government has got us to in this nation to get ready to put people back into jobs. Thank you. Senator Ayers. Mr. President, uh, you can see from Senator Davies' remarks, and you could certainly see from Senator Cormann's performance uh, today in question time, what the, what the government's plan really is for the Australian economy.
They can't wait to get to snap back when millions of Australian workers, hundreds of thousands of Australian firms will be forced off JobKeeper and millions of people off to Centrelink onto the unemployment queues. They're just not going to tell the people of Australia about it until after the Eden Monero by-election. It's their secret plan to put off hundreds of thousands of lost jobs, millions of Australians right now looking for work or underemployed. But the main game for this lot is always all about the slogans, never about the substance, always about the marketing, never about the delivery. What they are all about is keeping it all on the down low, getting their way through the winter break, getting their way through the Eden Monero by-election without telling the people of Eden Monero what they are really going to do. And we know what they are really going to do because they have made it very, very clear. Very clear indeed. The millions of workers who are on JobKeeper will be pushed across to Centrelink, left to the mercy of the market. And all of the rhetoric, all of the carry-on, all of the smugness from the leader of the government in this place, the Minister for Finance, cannot, cannot obscure the truth of their secret plan for jobs in Eden Monero, their secret plan for jobs in Australia, which is they are going to leave the Australian economy to the market forces. They are going to leave uh, ordinary Australians who have been relying on the JobKeeper scheme. Uh, they are going to leave them to Centrelink. They are going to leave them to the unemployment queues. And we will see from this government more economic failure, more, uh, more policy failure and more policy stagnation. Thank you, Senator Ayres. Pursuant to order, we interrupt business, uh, and I'll put the motion moved by Senator Watt that um, the question answers be taken note of. Set all of those that that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator